Hey Flaxies, this is Dr. Hugh coming at you and today I'm going to present lots and lots of research I've been doing on this topic and the topic is a four letter word which is mold. So how is mold affecting you as a Flaxie if you actually have mold? So in my opinion with all my research that I've been done doing is mold is a very a very significant problem if you have it. Now, if you don't have it, great, but if you have it, there's no way you are going to get better if you have mold exposure and you have mold in your body. Now, I've been practicing for 21 years. I've been doing functional medicine for 10, and always as a practitioner, I always and always open to possibilities, and sometimes uh, I learn just as much from my patients as my patients learn from me. This is a key indicator of a good practitioner. A good practitioner is always willing to learn from his patients. Why? Because patients will study, 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 study thousands of hours of studying to figure out their problems. Some people do that. Some patients do that. So I'm always willing and always open to learning from my patients. And so this discovery on mold came from one of my patients who was just diving down in, a, in a, his own case and discovered mold. And then this lead me, led me to have another realization or a cognition. Maybe I'm missing this piece of the puzzle in Floxies. Now, for many, many years, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the functional medicine world, mold has always been talked about. The problem was that there was no really good uh, affordable, the key thing is affordable test for mold until roughly about a year ago, Great Plains came out with a magnificent test that's very affordable and very reliable to check mold to see if you have actually mold in your body. And it's very simple. It's a first morning urine sample uh, to check if you have mold. So let's get in, into this topic. And before I really dive into this topic, what I want to say is if you have mold exposure, active in your body, you have mold in your body, you are going to have a very, very, very difficult time recovering from being flaxed or any disease. And this test is very affordable. So in my opinion, it's very critical to rule out if you have mold exposure or not. So let's dive into the PowerPoint here and let's get on to this and uh, see if we can bring some light into your case and uh, move your needle from being flaxed to healing. Because at the end of the day, what my goal is for you in the Flaxy community is to shed light on this disease and give you answers and where there's help, there's hope. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, give me a thumbs up, man, because that helps my videos uh, be pushed up. So when people search uh, Flax or Flax Recovery, my videos come up or down below, you're going to see subscribe. You can subscribe to my station. I have currently like 180 videos on YouTube. So the purpose of this is ground roots education. And um, once you have some education, some basic foundations, uh, then, you, then you can recover. Okay, so do I have mold toxicity and being flexed? So this is a really bad combination. Having mold and being toxed and being flexed. And I'll explain this to you in a short bit. So really, the, the two class of molds that we're really going to be concerned about is one is going to be food. That's a very small percentage of people that have uh, mold in their body it comes from food. The biggest one is from mold in your house. So it doesn't, uh, this mold can accumulate over a year. So if you've had mold exposure 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, that mold can still be residing within your body, causing problems in your body that mimic floxing. So maybe you got floxed. And besides that, you had mold in your body prior to being flexed. This makes the perfect storm of a body uh, that's not going to heal. So when I look at a case, I look at your case as a polytherapy approach. So how many different things that can we do to move the needle from flex to health? Now, initially, when it comes to the testing, the testing is just a fishing net. The fishing net, the bigger your fishing net is, you throw the fishing net out, the bigger your fishing net is, the more information that you're going to gather. So on a functional medicine um, viewpoint is I do testing to rule in and rule out certain different things. And this now, this testing, this mold test is something that I'm going to be doing because there's no way that 
uh, you know, I, you're just not going to get better if you have mold, and there's no way that you have mold unless you actually get tested. So 90% of mold exposure is going to be from buildings, and you can see right here that is the mold. Now let me go over some some terminology so um, we can understand what's going on. So I'm not going to try and get into big medical terms because at the end of the day that doesn't help you and it doesn't help me. So I try and keep my stuff very simple, very A to B, so you can understand it. Because at the end of the day, if you understand something, then you have certainty on how to get out. If you have an understanding, something makes sense. If there's no understanding, if big words are, are um, if I say a bunch of big words and you don't know those big words, that doesn't help you at all. And my goal is to help you and give some clarity on what's happening. So when we talk about mold, what we have here is this right here is actually the mold itself, the black stuff, the green stuff, whatever it is, whatever coal, whatever color it is. Then what we have is we have the mold spores. So this would be, this whole thing right here would be the mold uh, head or the mold plant. Then we have the, the spores right here, spores right here. All these little dots are the spores, okay? So what happens when it comes to mold is we have the mold and then we have a little spore that comes off kind of like the pollen the pollen on the trees okay so so we have the spores then what happens the spores produce a toxin called myotoxin which is like poop okay this is I'm just gonna keep it kind of simple so we have the more the, the the mold spore and that mold spore produces poop now that poop is what we call myotoxin. So the poop, the poop of the spores, right here, the spores is called myotoxin. Now it's the my now it's the myotoxin that is so dangerous. This is a poison in your body. So if you've been breathing in mold, right? You've been breathing in mold spores, then what happens is when you breathe these into your body, the mold spores produce their own poop, which is called a myotoxin. That is where you get all the detrimental effects and the health effects is from the myotoxin or the poop. Now here, you can see right here, this is some of the uh, mold exposure symptoms. Now what are you going to see right here? Mold exposure symptoms and floxy symptoms are very similar. They go hand in hand. So clinically, what I've seen is if you've been floxed and you have mold, active mold in your body, your symptoms and your symptoms are like a thousand times worse. You're gonna have a lot more symptoms and it's gonna be very a lot harder for you to recover, especially if you don't know if you have a mold exposure. So this is the test. So this is Great Plains. Now what you're looking at here is one of my patients gave me uh, permission to show you this. Now I'm not going to release his name or anything like that. So so this so so my patient here was one that has led me into this direction where maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing this piece of the puzzle. Again, I want to learn just as much from my patients as my patients learn from me. Always be open to learning something new. That's, that's the lesson today. Always be open to learning something new. Now, this is very simple test. You do this, uh, it's a urine sample. You do this in the morning, first morning. Then you can see here, these are all the big words for the different molds, right? Now, what I want you to bring your attention to is this gliotoxin right down in here. Now, the level here, we want this to be 200 or less. So we want this to be 200 or or less is normal. Now, can you see his lab right there? His lab is what? 6,188. Now the normal's 200. So this is ridiculously what? High. So right now this tells us that, that this is, uh, he has active mold in his body. Now, what I want you to tell you, what I want, want to tell you about this testing here is just so you know how prevalent it is. The lab I'm showing you of my patient here, he's actually in the construction business. He actually owns a construction company. He's been in the construction, the construction business for 30, 30 years, and he had no idea 
that there was mold growing in, in, in his house. He had no clue, right? So you just look at how, how undercover, how covert mold exposure can be when you have a very successful man in the, in the construction world industry for, for 30 years not know that there was mold there. This is why you test and don't guess. Right. This is why you test and don't don't guess, especially considering how affordable and easy this test is to do. So gliotoxin, he's off the charts. Now, do you think this is a game changer for his case? Do you think knowing this is a game changer? Guess what? This is a huge game changer for his case. And it's a huge game changer for your case if you're still suffering. So he went into his house and he brought mold experts in there. Guess what they found? They found mold. Right? The experts found mold. So now he's handling the mold in his house. But now, because the mold is so deep in his body, now you have to detox mold. Now, this isn't about protocols on detoxing or eliminating mold. It's, it's it, what this workshop is about is to give you some understanding that mold may be a problem when it, when it talks to, when we're, when we're talking about your given specific uh, situation here. Now, what I want to get, oh, what I want to convey here is how, uh, how small, how small mold is. Okay, so mold loves, or myotoxins, I should say, the myotoxins love fat. Okay, so that's concept number one. They love fat, and they're very, very, very small. So I'm going to give you a relative comparison, so you can see how small this mold is now why is that so important because it's small because if it's in your body and it's so small that meaning that means that it can penetrate deep deep into your tissues deep into your brain deep into your gut deep into your muscles deep into your tendon why can it do that because it's so darn small so let me show you how small this is actually this is going to be a shocker how small this is so myotoxins have a very low molecular weight, okay? They're a thousand deltons. Now, let me just clarify this. So what a deltan is, is a measurement of something that's very, very light. Now, like when you go step on the scale, we talk about pounds. So you weigh 100 pounds, 150 pounds, 200 pounds, okay? Now, when we talk about something that's very small, we talk in deltons. So the myotoxin is a thousand deltons. Well, what does that mean? It really doesn't mean anything unless you compare it to something else, right? So let's do the comparison right now. So this right here. So now what you're looking at here, this is an IgG. And I, just stay with me on this, an IgG, this is part of your immune system, okay? Now, if you get any kind of vaccination, they stick you with like... Um, whatever the the flu vaccine like they're actually giving you an IgG injection so what this is is what an IgG is it's part of your immune system that goes around and surveys to see if you have the flu is that does that look like the flu and then this IgG which is an antibody will attach to it okay now the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because I want you to see the relative comparison between an IgG size and mycoplasm now we have, I don't know how many, but trillions and trillions of IG antibodies in your body. Now, we're doing this in the COVID world right now. Now, how they check to see if you have COVID is actually see if you have an IgG antibody, which is what this is right here. Now, check out this weight. 150,000 deltons right here. So we have 150 deltons right versus what a thousand deltons so if you look at your immune system we have trillions and trillions of ig uh, g which are a hundred and fifty thousand deltons which is the weight versus a thousand so that just tells you the relative size that we're talking about and how deep that these can penetrate into your tissue so here's just another visual if you've watched my stuff on youtube you know i like visual so so for simple sakes, we're not even going to go with deltas. We're going to just go with pounds. Why? Because everyone can relate to pounds. All right. So here we have 150, 
thousand pounds IgG, which there's trillions and trillions of these in your body, versus a thousand pounds, which is the mycotoxin or the or the poop. So again, I can't restate how deep how how these myotoxins penetrate so deeply into the tissues and really will affect every organ in in your body. Now, one of the things that I've noticed clinically, at this point in my career, I've helped thousands of phloxies. Here's what I believe is happening to some of these, to some phloxies, and this could be you, is I'm also starting to do a blood-brain barrier testing. Now, what is that? That's that's actually to see if you if your blood brain barrier is broken and allowing a whole bunch of inflammatory things to get from your blood into your brain, causing neuroinflammation, causing an array array of weird neurological symptoms that no one can explain: muscle twitching, numbness, tingling, anxiety, heart racing, uh, poor GI system, brain fog. Uh, Brain fatigue, eye twitching, eye muscles that don't work right, tingling in your ears, weird sounds, you can't listen to light. Okay, so when you have brain inflammation, all the toxins in your bloodstream get into your brain. Now, guess what? Myotoxins love what? Fat. So they zoom right into your brain and cause more problems in your brain. So why I bring this up? is I'm going to be talking about the blood-brain barrier here and the gut barrier. So we have the blood-brain barrier and we have the gut barrier, okay? The gut barrier. So here's what happens. Is the gut barrier between the outside world and the inside world is one cell thick. Now, if you cut your finger here with a knife and you get blood, you have to go through like thousands and thousands of skin cells to get blood. Now, if I had your intestinal system, if I had if I had your, your small intestine here, it would be one cell thick between the outside, which is your gut, and the inside, one cell thick. Same thing with your blood-brain barrier. It's one cell thick. So how good of a barrier is that? It is a very poor barrier. So this is what this looks like. So this right here, this would be your food, okay? This is food right here. All this is food, okay? Now this is one cell thick, this is normal. Then you can see what happens here when you start to get blood, uh, when you start to get gut barrier breakdown. You see how this is starting to get leaky gut. All these food particles get in your bloodstream, get in your bloodstream and cause inflammation. Now, let's get to your brain. Your brain is only one cell thick. Your, your blood brain barrier is only one cell thick as well. Now the thing with your brain here is you can't grow new neurons, man. Like once your neurons are damaged, like they're damaged for life. Like this is a serious condition. If you have any neurological problems, this is a significant condition that you need to figure out and stop the neurodegeneration. Now it's not like your white blood cells, that's your immune system. Your immune system, like your white, white blood cells, you produce new white blood cells all day long from your bone marrow, not in your brain. You don't produce new neurons, right? You can grow new skin. You can grow new digestive system. You don't grow new neurons. So this is why this is so, so critical. So now look at the blood-brain barrier. So this is the blood. Okay, let me change my color here. It might give you a little better per perspective. Okay, oh. Okay, so this is the blood right in there. And then you can see here, this is the one cell, your blood-brain barrier, and then it's starting to get breached. Now, if you have mild toxins in here, these green things, boom, they get in, get in, cause neuroinflammation, which is very, very, very bad. Now, here's another diagram. Let me erase some of this stuff so we can see what we're looking at here. Okay, so this is just another visual. I like to give visuals because... You know, visuals are worth a thousand words, okay? So what we're looking at here is this right here is this right here is normal, non-disruptive changes. So this right here, down here, this is your ner nerves, okay? So this is your nerves right here, this this white stuff here, that's your nerves. Or astrocytes, this is part of your your, your nervous system and your brain. Now you can see here, this is the tight junctions between the cells. 
So if you go right here, you see these tight junctions right here, the tight junctions right here, okay? That's between the cells right there. So this right here, let me erase that, I shouldn't have done that. So this right here is normal. Then what's happening here, you see this tight junction is breaking down, tight junction changes. Then when tight junction changes, things can get right into your, this is your, I'm gonna say this is where your brain right in here. Brain sits right in here, right? And then this here starts this inflammatory process and this starts to go crazy right here. So this is what you wanna have, normal here, this is a blood-brain barrier breach right there. Now, one of the things I do want to bring your attention to here again is we can test. We can test your blood brain barrier. Now, what this is, when you look at this right here, this is a test that I'm doing. This is a blood brain barrier breach. So let me actually go back one slide here. You see this here? You see how that's breaking right here? And this would break right here. When your blood brain barrier breaks, is if you take a, a graham cracker, perfect example, okay? If you take a graham cracker and you snap that graham, cr graham cracker in half, all the crumbs are going to fall on the table. So when you have a blood-brain barrier breach, there's little particles of crumbs in here in your blood that we can measure to actually see if you have a blood-brain barrier breach. And this is what this test checks. So down here, you can see right here, this would be the crumbs down in here. And we know the crumbs look a certain way. We know what your blood-brain barrier looks like. We have a pattern of it. It's very, it's like a, a necklace on, on a, it's like a pearl necklace that have different colors. We know exactly what the blood-brain barrier actually looks like, and we can measure that in blood. If you have, if you have these particles in your blood, we're checking this right here, proteins, IgG. Again, you see this, this is the immune system part, IgG. We're checking to see if you have these in your blood. If you have blood brain proteins, IgG, in your blood, guess what that tells you? You have a blood brain barrier breach or holes in your blood, blood brain, and all the things are going right into your brain causing havoc, including what? The four letter word, mold, okay? So this is why I wanted to make this video, to give you some visual understanding of what's happening with mold. And you can go on Facebook and there's there's like uh, groups that have uh, 20,000, 30,000 members just designated just for mold. So this is information that's out there that's available. And you can see here, this is normal, normal, and this is out of range. So this is actually one of my patients, a Floxies. He has a blood-brain barrier breach. He had a whole bunch of neurological problems, sleeping problems, heart racing, anxiety, uh, lights were hurting his eyes, sounds. He had a bunch of uh, GI problems because guess what? Your brain controls, controls your GI system. Your GI system also influences your brain. So anyway, there's lots and lots of things um, that can be affecting it. So one of the things when you look at you recovering from being floxed is you have to take a polytherapy approach. You have to throw out your fishing net, the labs, and reel what's in and rule in and rule out significant things. Now, there's a hierarchy of the things that you need to start with. And again, this isn't uh, you know a three-hour lecture on restoring, you know, restoring your body back or recovering from being floxed. It's strictly just to show you that what what myotoxins mold can do, and that this can be highly possible that you have this in your body and it doesn't have to be like exposure in the last three months it could be from 20 years ago where the mold is still in your body so with that being said i have a saying and um, where there's help there's hope so on that note floxies who wherever you're watching this united states australia all around the globe wherever you're watching this I want to let you know, I hope this video touched you, made some sense to you. And at the end of the day, where there's help, there's hope. At the bottom of this video in the description, you're going to see uh, how to get a hold of me. If you, want to, if you want some professional guidance, one on one program or some advice on how to move forward and recover, it's available to you. And now with the Internet you can have access to getting better, even if you're not even in the United States, if you're in someplace in Africa, 
uh, Russia, uh, UK, wherever it is. I've helped people, Philippines, I've helped people all over the world at this point. Take care. Bye-bye.